Well, once again, let me greet everyone and welcome you to our workshop today on learning to love SEO. My name again is Jerry Rackley. I am the chief analyst here at Demand Metric, and I'm joined by John Follett, who is our chief marketing officer, and will be making the presentation to you today. The first thing I'd like to do is I want to thank our sponsor, which is Act On. You'll see their logo on our screen. Act On was created to empower businesses to effectively market online at a fraction of the effort and cost incurred by more complicated systems. And they make it easy for marketing teams to do sophisticated multi-channel marketing via a simple yet highly intuitive suite of integrated capabilities. So we are grateful to act on in their generosity for sponsoring this workshop, which makes it free to everyone. So let us go through now and talk about what we have in store for you today, beginning with our presenter. And that is, as I mentioned, John Follett who is the Chief Marketing Officer here at Demand Metric? He has a number of responsibilities, including lead generation, product development, partner programs, and community. You can learn a lot more about John by visiting our website, and there is a URL on the screen that will take you to information about John. And before I proceed any further, let me make just a couple of housekeeping announcements. Uh, one is we are recording our session today. So if you'd like to listen to it again or share it with someone, since you registered for and are attending, you will get an email from us in the next day or two that contains the link. That email will also have the directions on how you can download a PDF copy of the presentation materials. The other thing I want to let you know is that we do welcome your questions. And uh, I think we have some questions that may already be coming in. But if you'll look at the console for our, our meeting room, there is an area where you can enter questions. I'll be monitoring that during the course of our session today. So you're encouraged to ask questions. We'll probably hold them till the end, but please ask questions. And with that, I think, John, I'm going to turn it over to you and make it your show. Well, thank you, Jerry. And uh, thanks to everyone for joining us today. I'm, uh, I've actually, Jerry, I just lost my internet connection, so I'm going in a bit blind here, but uh, we kind of talked about how we could navigate through the slides together, and um, so I appreciate everyone's patience. Uh, today's agenda, which is up in front of you, as you'll see, uh, this is not going to be a very deeply technical webinar. The plan today is really to focus on SEO from a marketing perspective, and by doing so, we're going to start off by talking a little bit about uh, an SEO capabilities audit, and really understanding where you are and where your organization is. We're going to talk about how we can drive more traffic to your website. We'll talk about different metrics that you can measure, and as well, uh, the road ahead, so things to come in SEO. If you have any technical questions, I would uh, encourage you to submit them to the Ask an Expert section of the Demand Metric website, and uh, we'll do our best to get you an answer through Demand Metrics. We also want you to join the conversation on Twitter. We're using the hashtag LoveSEO. And you can also reach out to us uh, by at Demand Metric and at Act On Software. So, Jerry, if we can move to the next slide. All right. We've got uh, slide five up, John. Awesome. I always uh, like to kick things off with a stat. And uh, this one is actually a Comscore stat. And according to Comscore, 19.2 uh, billion explicit core searches were conducted in June 2013. Uh, with Google site ranking first with 12.8 billion, Microsoft sites ranking uh, second, followed by Yahoo, Ask, and then AOL. So how does this kind of break down? Let's just go to the next slide. You'll see that within those searches, obviously Google still dominates. Uh, Google sites, led U.S. explicit core search market in June 2013 with 66.7% market share. And I'm going to talk a lot about Google today. So uh, it doesn't mean that other search engines are not important. They absolutely are. But there's a lot of good information through Google. And of course, Google seems to be dominating. Can we just proceed to the next slide? So every two years, Moz runs a ranking factors study. And in 2013, this was just released. The goal is really to determine which attributes of pages and sites have the strongest association with ranking highly in Google. The study itself consists of two different parts. Uh, the first is a survey of professional SEOs. 
and there's also a large correlation study. If you look at the uh, data here, I know it's pretty small, but I'll kind of walk through some of it. Uh, SEOC is a shift away from traditional ranking factors, things like anchor text, exact match domains, etc. And there's a more, uh, much more of an emphasis on things like the site's perceived value to users, authorship, structured data, and also social signals. Today we're going to do our best to kind of explain why this is. Obviously, there's a lot of change happening in this space, and as marketers, we need to stay on top of these changes, whether it's an algorithm change or the loss of a high-ranking page on your site. It's important that we accept the fact that when it comes to SEO, change is inevitable. So our online behavior is forever changing. Before we kind of dive deep into some of the content here, I, uh, I just want to address the use of acronyms. <laughs> and um, during my last presentation with Acton, it was politely brought to my attention that an acronym that I used to discuss how to improve and review your email campaign was completely inaccurate. I used uh, a ter well an acronym ACE, Accountability, Process, Empowerment, and Systems. These are actually not apes that you see before you. Uh, I've, I've never claimed to be a zoologist, but after being called out, I'm now aware that most species of monkeys have tails, apes lack tails. So you'll be happy to know that none of the acronyms used in today's presentation are my own. They're all completely valid terms. So learning to love SEO, what uh, is this all about? I want to talk a little bit about my journey and how I came to love SEO. When we first started this business, the inbound strategy at Demand Metric was non-existent. We started building templates, we put them on the internet, and really to our surprise, people started finding us. We didn't know anything about SEO at first, but we had a great web developer uh, who ended up leaving us after about five, well, five years ago to take a job at Google in Mountain View, California of all places. But if we fast forward now, five years ahead, one of my primary objectives is lead generation, which in this case happens to be very closely related to my other equally important objective of content development. Both of these objectives are part of a larger, much more comprehensive marketing strategy, and the two work closely together to accomplish some pretty neat things. Today, between the leads that we generate for demand metric and also our partner-generated leads, we create over 3,000 individual leads per month and tens of thousands of leads for our partners. It's hard to put a dollar value on the actual amount, but there's no doubt that it's in the multi-millions of dollars. What's neat about the way we do things here is that we rarely use paid search. And don't get me wrong, I'm a fan of paid search, but and I think it definitely has its uses. Uh, for today, we're going to stick to search engine optimization, driving organic traffic to your website. So I didn't love SEO at first, but now I've kind of learned to love some things about SEO. So part one. We're going to talk about a, little, a few of the different terms that are associated with SEO, and we're going to ask you the question, do these words really mean anything to you? So when we talk about SEO, things like 301s, permanent server redirects come up, SERPs, search engine results pages, meta tags, you might know that it's important to have unique and accurate meta title and description tags because even though things have changed, search engines still rely on them to determine what a page is all about. Alt text, which is a description of a graphic. Uh, usually isn't displayed to the end user, but it's important because search engines can't really tell one picture from another. A sitemap, which is a page or structured group of pages that links to every user accessible page on a website, hopefully improves the usability by clarifying the data structure for users. And here are some other words. You'll see them in the word cloud. There are a ton of words 
in the SEO vocabulary. If you're feeling ambitious and you want to learn about them, you're welcome to check out the complete glossary of essential SEO jargon. Uh, the source is the Moz blog. And if you're familiar with these terms, then you know, you're off to a good start. The, the bad news is that this glossary was actually put together in 2007, which is the same year that the first iPhone was introduced in the US. So you know, it's a good foundation that you've got, but there's a lot of new things that are happening and we're, we're going to talk about those today. Things like canonical URL tags, which help webmasters and site owners eliminate self-created duplicate content. And you'll see later on in the presentation that this is some pretty important stuff. Custom 404s, which expose important content like pages, articles, videos, site maps to visitors who are lost on your website so that they can really understand where they are. Google authorship, which is determined partly through verified online profiles like Google Plus profiles. Page rank, um, of course, will be increased and influenced by the authority of a page's author. We'll get into that. Panda, and we're not talking about animals here. This is a Google al uh, algorithm that's used to detect low quality duplicate content and penguins. So another Google algorithm uh, to devalue link spam. So, um, so uh, it really is something that's going to support structured data, I think, in my, my mind here with uh, the penguin, but we're going to kind of uh, talk a little bit about that. So you're getting warmer if you know those terms. That's, that's a great, uh, great sign. We're moving in the right direction here. I want to spend a few minutes on some great resources that will really help you audit your skills and fill in some of the gaps. So the first up here is the SEO starter guide. And this is a guide that's actually from Google. And it starts by teaching you the basics. Things like title tags, meta tags, um, complete with tips and also best practices. There's a section on site structure, URLs, navigation, sitemaps. It puts an emphasis on and also stresses the importance of creating unique content. There's a lot of common sense in this document. Uh, things like watching out for spelling mistakes on your website, staying away from duplicate content. Make sure that you're writing content for users and not necessarily the search engines. And like we'll see in a few minutes, that is really more important now than ever before. If you're interested in the more technical side of SEO, it has a great explanation of crawl restrictions and no follows, as well as promotions, specifically links and social. One of the best practices tips that really resonated with me is that you should avoid promoting each new small piece of content that you create. It seems maybe counterintuitive at times, but Google suggests that you actually go for the big interesting items, save your promotions for those things. In general, this guide covers a lot of terms that are, that are in the Moz glossary. It even touches on mobile, and it references tools like the Google Webmaster tools, the keyword tools, and also content experiments, which was formerly the website optimizer. It's now part of Google Analytics, and it's really cool. You can actually see inside of your website, and you can see where people are clicking. So if you haven't already checked that out in Google Analytics, I strongly suggest that you take a look. Next up, um, the Beginner Guide to SEO, and this is from Moz. It has over 1 million views. Again, provides a good basic explanation of how search engine, uh, engines work, including some info on, on search engine ranking factors, like what we saw earlier. They do break down how people interact with some search engines, and they suggest that there are three different types of queries. When people are looking, they'll either uh, have a transactional query, they call it a do, which is an action that queries, you know, such as buying a new pair of shoes would be a transactional query. No or informational queries, and that's when a user seeks information. So if someone's looking for the best hotel in the United States. There's also navigational queries, go queries. So queries that seek a particular online destination, like someone who's looking for a demand metric website. Moz also talks about how SEO really is a marketing function and how marketers still hold a lot of power. They have some great examples of what 
we see when we're browsing versus what the search engines see. It's a good resource for keyword tagging. In fact, there's an entire chapter dedicated to keyword research. There's no way to go, uh, reason to go through the whole list here, but it's worth mentioning that if you've had a bad uh, negative experience with SEO, um, if you've conducted black hat techniques or keyword stuffing, they do provide uh, some high level guidance that'll help you get out of the doghouse. So the beginner guide to SEO for Moz. Next up, SEO 101, the basics and beyond. Uh, this is an act on guide. The guide does go into some technical detail, but I love it because it's been written from a business kind of marketing context. And it provides some great instructions, how to use the Google keyword tool if you, if you haven't used it before, how to use long uh, tail keywords, and most importantly, how to write content that really resonates with your audience. We'll touch back on this stuff in just a bit. Finally, we have the demand metric SEO maturity assessment. This was built a few years ago, but it's still a good diagnostic tool, especially if you're just getting started with SEO. It is used to evaluate your organization's SEO maturity across four key success drivers that you see listed in front of you, strategy, buy, and skills, process definition, automation, and systems, keyword management, and reporting results and metrics. The template was designed to help you benchmark your current maturity level so that you can really show continuous improvement over time. So in summary, part one, we want to make sure that you understand your capabilities. We want to make sure that you've brushed up on your SEO basics. We want to make sure that you've identified your knowledge gaps and that you've filled those knowledge gaps before moving on to part two, which is drive more traffic. So SEO doesn't have to be boring like our friend here. Before we start talking about how you can drive more traffic to your website, let's just make sure that the following five things are already taken care of. Make a few assumptions. First, we're operating under the assumption that you already have a well-built website. And that's complete with all the bits and pieces that we mentioned earlier, things like sitemaps, both HTML, as well as XML. I want to make sure that you've taken care of the can uh, canonical URLs, that you have metadata, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If these things have not been done yet, you need to find yourself a good web developer. If you're about to conduct a website redesign, you might want to check out our website redesign methodology on the demand metric site. I've been fortunate in that I've always worked with good developers, and our developers seem to be at the forefront of SEO. If you're thinking about working with someone new, don't be afraid to ask them the tough questions. Check out their sites, look at their portfolio, and look beyond the design. Try running some searches, see how well they're indexed. If you're building landing pages, make sure that your landing pages are SEO friendly. Same goes with blogs, which by the way, is still a great way to develop a relationship with your audience and also drive traffic to your site. That said, it's important that both your landing pages and your blog get indexed appropriately and that they move up the search rankings of major search engines as well. ActOn has an SEO audit tool uh, it's meant to help you optimize your landing page, web page, uh, and also form so that you can fine tune your keywords and metadata. They also have a plugin for blogs that'll help you optimize your blog. What's interesting about the plugin is that it allows your bloggers to actually perform an SEO audit on a draft proof. And then in real time, it gives them a score, some coaching, and all that's meant to help boost your rankings. So point number one, in order to love SEO, you need to be working with a good foundation when it comes to systems uh, and also infrastructure. Number two, you have content, which uh, might seem like a no-brainer, but the trick here is that your content is unique, that it's valuable, and that it's intended for a specific audience. It needs to map into the buyer journey, and it's not just content for the sake of having content. So if you want to audit your content, you want to take a look at what you have, I would suggest that you use the content marketing methodology. And the methodology is meant to really help you put together a comprehensive content marketing plan, complete with a supporting set of tools, templates that'll help you do things like mapping your buyer personas, 
figuring out the different buying stages, also doing an inventory of your existing content assets, some message mapping, uh, even keeping track of SEO keywords just in an Excel file. So there's lots of good stuff in here. I've got a picture here of a couple different infographics that we've recently launched. And the point is just that when it comes to content, you can be a little bit creative these days. I think everyone knows that you don't have to be tied down to the same things that you've always done. It pays to you know, take some risks in certain cases. And these are two infographics uh, from our site that have really done wonders. Uh, in fact, we've generated tons of traffic. We've received links from sites that only a few years ago we never thought we would have accomplished. And beyond website links, we've also been featured in third-party email newsletters. There's been lots of social sharing. So the bottom line here is just expand your horizons. Number three, you have realistic goals. This is a really important one. You need to know that SEO is a long-term commitment. It isn't just a quick set it and forget it. So don't expect all of your pages to be ranked number one overnight. Remember, the only constant in SEO is change. Number four, understand the data. And what do we mean by this? Well, if you are capturing data, even if it's Google Analytics, you have to know how to interpret things like your rankings, your traffic, conversions, including keyword performance. And when it comes to keywords, you have to be able to manipulate branded keywords. So people that already know your brand versus generic traffic. So people who are uh, versus those who are brand loyal. A demand metric is pretty simple for us. We work to uh, identify members versus non-members. Just you know, something to think about. What about the type of searches that your prospects are running and where they are in the buying cycle? For us, it's pretty safe to say that someone searching for a bout demand metric is in a different stage of the buying cycle than someone who's searching for a demand metric analyst membership. So you need to be able to understand this data. And the fifth assumption here, the final assumption, you need to know your competition. So competitor research in this case involves analyzing other websites that rank well for keywords. And this is a really important part of SEO because it helps you, first of all, benchmark your performance. It helps you identify opportunities and weaknesses in content, keywords, and even social media. And it'll even help you to highlight some of your strengths, figure out what you're doing right, and it'll give you a better understanding of what you can accomplish given the right amount of effort. If you're doing a competitor analysis, we've got a competitor analysis template. Uh, there's a social media plan methodology as well that talks a little bit about doing some competitive analysis. So make sure that you know your competition. Bottom line here is that small changes can equal a big difference. If we had more time, I would do a full session on each of today's assumptions. But for the purpose of today's presentation, let's assume that you have a good website, you have some solid content, You've, you come into this with some realistic goals and expectations. You can interpret the data and you know what your competitors are up to. Let's switch gears now and focus on optimizing specific content for search placement. No gaming involved here. Um, we're not trying to trick the search engines. What this section involves is potentially changing the way that you're delivering your content. You might be doing this already, but what I'm proposing is taking a more agile approach to SEO. This is especially helpful for the do-it-yourselfers out there. Like I said, SEO is not a one-time thing. The five steps that you see before you are adapted from Miley Oyeg, and they can be found in an article on Capture Commerce. But first, what is agile marketing? According to agilemarketing.net, agile marketing is an approach to marketing that takes its inspiration from agile software development. The core values include things like responding to change, conducting rapid iterations, testing and data, conducting numerous 
small experiments over a few large bets. Individuals and interactions over target markets and collaboration within corporate silos. The goal of agile marketing is to improve the speed, predictability, transparency, and adaptability to change of the marketing function. So within the context of SEO, let's start out by defining key, uh, key performance indicators. And I'm big into lead gen, as you know, so I would probably pick something like a lead gen conversion rate, but the KPI that you select might be something like order conversion rate or average order value. Could be average revenue per visit or even average cost per conversion. Once we pick the KPI, then we actually implement some improvements. And improvements within SEO usually fall into a few different buckets. The first would be new keywords with an existing content. The next would be a new keyword with new content. Third, keywords that convert, but they've fallen in search rank. And finally, newly discovered keywords that actually convert. So we implement some changes, and then we measure success. So for some KPIs, this is really simple to do. In others, it's a little bit more difficult. We're gonna talk about measurement in the next section. After measuring change, then we actually start to create some improvements. So after you interpret the data, you gain insight from it, you make some recommendations, that's gonna to help to increase your conversion rate and bring a better KPI impact. Each recommendation though is actually just a hypothesis that needs to be tested thoroughly and you need to be able to prove that it's worthwhile. The fifth step here, prioritize improvements based on ROI and your marketing team's capability. You can do this by prioritizing and assigning a probability score based on your capabilities. We're actually working on a new template over here uh, that we're gonna go live uh, soon with that'll help you with doing exactly this. Things that you wanna prioritize, um, the list would include estimated value in terms of ROI, implementation requirements, figuring out who is responsible for that implementation, and expected dependencies to implementation. So just a quick review here, um, you know, even SEO can be agile. Next up, the summary. So by taking a results-oriented approach, it's gonna help you drive more traffic to your site. For me, it wasn't until SEO actually became a competition that I really started to embrace it. But at first, it's all about forming some good habits. So next up, what to measure. The bottom line is that it depends on your goals and objectives. It really also depends on the size of your company and also your level of sophistication. I had a chance to look through the list of registrants for today's uh, workshop and there's a huge range. We've got everyone from marketing coordinators to C-level executives. There are even a few SEO people in here. So if you're highly sophisticated, the metrics that you're measuring won't vary kind of compared to the beginner metrics, but they certainly will get a lot more advanced. So in terms of measuring your SEO success, I would suggest at the very least the following four metrics, but I wanna stress that this is only one way of measuring success. I realize that all campaigns are unique and that we all have different goals, but in order to implement a results-based actions within an SEO campaign, it's important that you're really, you figure out which metrics are right for you. The first one here, pages. This seems really simple, but uh, you need to know the number of pages that search engines um, have actually indexed because the inclusion of index pages is essential to earning traffic. So this, this number here of pages actually gives you a very simple baseline number that'll help you indicate if the trend is positive or negative. And if you need to work on certain major issues within your website, your site maps, um, the site architecture, or even if your developer needs to, this is probably one of the first things that I would personally go to. The next is search. Performance metrics generated from non-branded search, like I mentioned earlier, um, and doing um, analysis with advanced filters in Google Analytics will allow you to do just that. 
Moz actually broke this down even further into referring sites. So direct navigation traffic from bookmarks, email links without tracking codes, referral traffic. Um, so this would be links from across the, the web, promotion, branded campaign links, and then search traffic. Engagement, uh, in, this, in this case it involves analyzing engagement factors, but at the keyword level. So looking at things like time on page, bounce rate for individual keywords, and also conversion. So um, probably most importantly, for me at least, uh, keywords that continually keep sending visitors who convert. And what we do is we increase the focus on those keywords. So you want to look closely at those pages. You're, you know, the first time you look at them, you may not notice anything glaringly obvious, but even subtle differences on a page can make a huge difference. So really think deeply about why certain pages are performing well, and then try and replicate your efforts uh, elsewhere. For those of you that are more advanced, um, you might want to consider things like uh, social signal monitoring, backlink intelligence, um, even international search tracking. But there's also search data that comes from multiple sources. And that's when things got a little bit uh, sticky with attribution issues. If you're that advanced, we can definitely do a spin-off section, talk about some different ways of doing that. So when it comes to measurement, start small. Don't bite off more than you can chew. Um, you don't have to dig right into the, the most difficult metrics. If you can just capture a few, get in the habit of, of really monitoring those, you can learn uh, quite a bit. So part four, the road ahead. And this is really, some of this is very conceptual, things that uh, might be happening in SEO, things that are definitely happening in SEO. And uh, it's important that you stay on top of, of both. So within the knowledge graph, um, the, basically the knowledge graph, if you don't know, is a model uh, that Google's developed. And it's meant to help give Google search engine the context that you and I have for search. It provides a model of the world and how the real world actually deals with abstract entities. So what you see before you, Leonardo da Vinci, um, basically within the example and a presentation that I'll share with you later, Jason Douglas, who's the lead developer at Google uh, for the Knowledge Graph platform, gives a great keynote and he provides an example. Instead of Leonardo da Vinci, he talks a little bit about Snoop Dogg. And so he talks about how Snoop was known as Snoop Dogg, Snoop Lion, his, his real name Calvin, Snoop Doggy Dog. And for me to say that, I think you know most people on the call would probably know who I'm talking about. We all have that context. Before Knowledge Graph, search engines really didn't have that context. The Knowledge Graph can actually now provide answers, do calculations, determine what things exist, summarize relevant facts and group related things of interest together, which is really, really cool. So how is this possible? Well, schema.org, um, schema.org is being used to describe these real world things in a very structured way. And you might be surprised to see the logos uh, together, Google, Bing, Yahoo, Yandex, but they're actually all working together to assemble a collective schema. Uh, and these are HTML tags that webmasters can use to mark up their pages in ways that are recognized by major search providers. Many sites are generated from structured data, which is also stored in databases, but when the structured data is actually formatted into an HTML uh, code, it becomes very difficult to actually recover that original structure. So lots of applications, especially search engines, can really benefit from having direct access to the structured data. On-page markup actually enables search engines to understand information about the websites, um, provide rich search results, and in order to make it easier for users to find uh, relevant information on the web. So markup can also be used uh, and enable new tools and applications uh, that makes use of this whole kind of structure. On the right-hand side here, uh, you'll see some examples of rich snippets. Snippets are actually the few lines of text that appear under each 
individual search results and they're designed to give users a sense of what's actually happening on the page and why it's relevant to their search. So before there was actually meta tags. It, if search engines understand the content on your pages, they can create these rich snippets, which is the detailed information. Um, and an example here is, you know, a restaurant might want to show the average review or their price range. And there might be a snippet for a recipe page that would show a picture or how much time it takes to actually prepare the meal. If we're talking music, you know, it could list songs. There's some very, very uh, useful use cases within a business context as well. And I think events is definitely one of them, upcoming events. Um, that's the kind of thing that would be uh, absolutely useful for us. So um, schema.org, you can visit their site. Uh, they do have a blog as well and to read all about it. So let's move into mobile. Mobile um, is kind of an interesting one for SEO. There have been some developments within the last year. I know that uh, when sites were being built and mobile was gaining popularity, people would actually start building separate sites for mobile, separate sites for desktop. That's definitely not encouraged uh, today. There, the rage is all responsive design. And uh, this is where you actually use CSS3 media queries that alter the way a page renders on mobile devices. So in this case, there's still only one URL. There's only you know, one piece of content. There's still one HTML code. But CSS actually specifies the rules that apply to the different browser types. So Google says the advantages of this method are that it makes it easier for users, users to actually interact with pages. And the algorithms uh, to assign the different, for, for Google, it assigns different algorithms to the indexing properties of your content. So it can greatly benefit you if you are, you know, trying to index for, and, uh, for, for certain keywords. Now, I realize that, you know, this is probably, there's a, an expense associated with it to create a responsive site. If you're not in the process of doing that, uh, a site redesign right now. Um, then there is an alternative device specific HTML, which is fine too. Um, it's supposed to work pretty well, but if you are doing or building a new site, um, this one just might be worth the extra investment. So you'll see in the picture, you know, how the site here renders the same way across all three different devices. Next up, PR. So driving SEO with press releases. Uh, this is a this is actually a, a how-to guide that Jerry put together. The bottom line with this one is that content quality is king, in you know as usual, I guess you could say, but nothing is kind of different for SEO. Just like other forms of content, you still need to think about keywords, keyword competition, headlines, links, distribution if you want to succeed. If done properly, uh, a press release can definitely help with link building with publicity, and it's, an Im it's immediate. So it happens very quickly. The pages get uh, indexed fast. So press, uh, press releases definitely aren't a thing of the past. They can certainly help you with your SEO efforts, and they can definitely help you drive more traffic. Social media. Uh, so I realize probably what you're seeing is a really small graph in front of you. Like Jerry said earlier, we're going to make sure we get this deck across later on. But I think it's important to take away the following. It's noticeable that social signals in this graph correlate well with better search rankings and content quality, as well as the number and diversity of, of backlinks. So you want to pay attention to your site structure. You want to make sure that your content is shareable. Um, make sure it's shareable on every single page. You want to make sure that you pick the right channels. And when we're talking about social media, you can use our social media channel selection tool to ensure that you're using the right channels for your audience. With Google+, Plus, um, this is something that you need to stay on top of is, is the authorship. In fact, if the current growth percentage rates remain consistent, Google+, Plus is going to take over Facebook in terms of social sharing by the beginning of 2016. So it's definitely coming. It's something, if you don't have uh, Google+, Plus authorship, you should visit uh, Google Plus authorship and uh, make sure that you get things validated. Um, also in here, a side note, something I 
probably should have uh, mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, site speed, which is an absolute must. You got to make sure that your pages render quickly. So sorry, I kind of overlooked that one, but you, definitely something to think about. So don't miss the following webmaster tools. Now, this is the, the part of the presentation. It's easy to kind of talk a little bit about content and developing good content for your audience. This is the, the most technical we're going to get today. Um, there are four different types of tools um, that even go a little bit deeper once you jump into them, but they're all really important. And this is based on the, the developments within schema.org, uh, as well as the knowledge graph. You'll see uh, an image there at the bottom right-hand corner. You can click that, jumps you right out to YouTube where you can watch the hour-long keynote on this stuff. Um, but here are a few different key takeaways. The first is the structured data testing tool. And this is the tool that actually lets you check your markup and make sure that Google can extract some structured data from your page. If you've created rich snippets for a Google custom search engine, then you can also use the structured data testing tool to preview the results. The Structured Data Markup Helper shows you how to, how to update your site so that Google and potentially other uh, companies uh, can understand the data that, that it actually contains. Once Google understands the data on your site, your data can be presented uh, much more attractively in a lot of different ways. So um, the Structured Data Markup Helper, simple kind of uh, copy and paste type tool. The Data Highlighter, it's a webmaster tool. Uh, it's used for teaching Google, actually, about the different pattern of structured data on your website. Uh, an example would be if your site contains, like I mentioned, an event listing. You can use the data highlighter to tag data, so things like the name of the event, location, date, and so on, for the events within your, within your website. And then next time Google crawls your site, the event data will actually become available for rich snippets. Webmaster tools. Um, many of you have probably been using them or at least playing around with them for, for a number of years. Um, still very useful today. The, I guess basically the top three things that we're doing with the, the webmaster tools, um, get Google's view uh, of your site and diagnose any different problems that it might encounter. You can discover your link and query traffic. And then of course, share information about your site with Google. So. Uh, some great tools. Uh, I don't have time to go into all of the different tools that the other search engines offer. There are a ton of them. Um, many of them are, are very similar, especially with schema.org, uh, working on the same kind of stuff. But it's definitely worth, um, you know, if you're, if you're limited in terms of time, starting with these tools and then branch, branching out from there. Now, I mean, that's assuming that your traffic is being it's actually coming from Google. If within your site you're seeing the majority of your searches are coming from Bing uh, or Yahoo, then definitely you're going to want to tap into their, uh, their webmaster toolkits as well. So a couple final thoughts here uh, before we get to the Q&A. Um, first up, you just want to know what your abilities are and you want to fill in the gaps as quickly as possible. A presentation like this will have tons of links. You can click through them on your own time afterwards and read in a little bit more detail of some of the research that we conducted in putting this together. You want to take a results-oriented approach to SEO. And really, if, you, uh, if you're like me and you like winning, then taking you know, that competitive approach uh, and kind of making it a bit of a game of SEO can really uh, work well, go a long way in helping you kind of love what you're doing. Uh, number three, measurement doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be impossible. You don't have to shoot for the stars and pick impossible KPIs to measure right off the bat. Start small. And finally, uh, be proactive and always keep learning. There's a laundry list of great blogs that you can follow that will keep you on top of any updates to algorithms, search engines, new research, and anything that you can absorb. Uh, can be extremely beneficial. It might just give you the competitive advantage that you need. So, Jerry, without further ado, um, hopefully we're both on the final slides together. Um, but uh, I believe I'm ready for a Q and A. All right, John. Uh, I appreciate that. Hopefully, we stayed in sync well enough that we didn't confuse anybody watching. We do have several questions. Let me try to get some of these. Um, if you have a question, please go ahead and enter it. 
even if we don't get to it, it will show up in our webinar report and we'll be able to follow up later. Um, okay, now we have one question here that says, if I create links with um, tracking code, GA tracking code, does that count as a duplicate page? I'm not sure I understand that question fully. Probably we're talking about uh, Google Analytics tracking code in that case. And um, th this kind of goes back to, uh, I guess my answer without knowing the full extent of the question would be those uh, canonical URLs. And what basically, just to kind of go into a little bit more detail about that, what has often happened is, um, and what can happen is you can have the same content across different URLs on the web. And when different search engines crawl that content, they think it's, it's duplicate content when in fact maybe all of that content belongs to just your particular web properties. Uh, Sonical URL will actually allow you to let the search engines know that no this isn't duplicate content in fact this is the same content so don't don't essentially penalize me for for having all these different pages. So uh, I don't know if that necessarily answers the question within the context of having GA tracking code, but uh, if that if that question is thrown up afterwards, um, the Ask an Expert site on the demand metric uh, uh, community, um, I'd be happy to kind of address that one in a little bit more detail. Sure, and that's really a great recommendation for everyone. Uh, if you go to the demand metric website, uh, we have a community. Uh, you can get a free community membership if you don't already have one. And John and myself and others all monitor the posts that you make to our community. And so it's a great way not only for us to see and try and answer your questions, but for everyone else in the community to do the same thing. Okay, John, here's another question. And uh, thank you for the questions. Keep them coming. Uh, and to answer one of them myself, yes, this uh, session is being recorded. And we will send an email out uh, in the next day or two with a link to both the recording and a PDF copy of the slides. Okay, here's another question, John. Do you have a recommendation for a social aggregator, a way to track mention of the company on various networks? Whew, okay, well, there are lots of different social aggregators. Um, I would probably default to, um, to our SEO methodology just to see paid versus free. Um, you know, and also, again, it depends on your level of sophistication. In order to track things like uh, social mentions, you know, there are just so many different op options that are free. We we here at Demand Metric use Hootsuite. I haven't, you know, had any major issues with it. I I think it kind of does the trick for us. But um, but there are tons of them out there. So the methodology will kind of help allude to the different um, the different paid versus free options. Okay, and, and let me add, even though this wasn't specifically the question, I think it's also important is um, just monitoring, social monitoring. And I've had recent discussions with some of our experts in our, our community about what they feel like some of the best monitoring tools are. And the, the answers I consistently get back are Radian 6 and Sysimos. And I don't profess to know a lot about either of those tools, but people that I respect who know a lot about social media and monitoring are both telling me that those are tools that are worth looking at. Yeah, I'll just add to that, Jerry. I mean, Radian 6, of course, is like what I would consider right now the Cadillac solution out there, um, but it comes with a price tag. So uh, I think it really, part of it depends on how much you're willing to invest in your social media program. If this is a huge strategic initiative for you, then it might definitely be worth uh, investing in something like that. Um, you know, so that's, uh, that's kind of just a little bit uh, of an add-on there. Okay. And we have um, time maybe for just another one or two questions. Let me see. Uh, I had a question here. Uh, John, what about the relevance of meta and title tagging versus inbound links? Do you have anything you can share with us on that? Um, well, what I will say is, you know, both are definitely important. Um, you want to make sure that your, uh, you've got proper title tags, metadata on your website, absolutely. Um, inbound links, though, uh, we're seeing much more of a, 
an importance factor weighted within the search engines on um, on credibility, basically. So if you can get inbound links coming from highly credible uh, sites, things that sites that have a very high page rank, then that's the, you know a great place to really focus your efforts. That kind of effort you know would take time. Um, you need to at least develop relationships with some of these high ranking pages to create good inbound links. And one of the things that you absolutely need to stay away from, I will say, is um, link spam. I mean, the, the days of conducting black hat techniques uh, are over. It's, uh, it's not worth it. We, I think as search engine kind of marketers, need to make sure that we're conducting things in, and, uh, and building links in a very ethical way. So inbound links, are amazing if you can get them from credible places. And I think that that's really the shift that's happened is the focus uh, for marketers is really de developing relationships in order to get the links that we need to, to improve our uh, optimization efforts. And John, I, you're, you're absolutely right about that. And I think it's also worth mentioning that um, the rules change all the time. And so what is valued and weighted heavily today could change based on the whims of one of the search engine providers, Google, of course, being the dominant provider. So that's why it's important to stay up on what's going on out there. And let me add, uh, one of our helpful viewers offered this on the discussion of social media monitoring tools, recommending visible technologies and brand watch as other good alternatives. And I think we have time for maybe one more question. And, and this one is, uh, what do you recommend in terms of a good pay-per-click management tool? We didn't really talk much about pay-per-click today. And John, I don't know if you've got a recommendation there, but it's an interesting question. So do you know of anything? Well, um, like I said, I mean, most of our search uh, does come from, from organic, or most of our traffic does come from uh, organic. Uh, I would say that, you know, there are lots of different um, – pay-per-click management tools out there. Uh, I don't know if I would feel comfortable making a recommendation today, but uh, I think that I, what I would be comfortable doing is maybe typing up uh, a follow-up post about a few different options out there. I would like to do you know, a free option versus paid option uh, type post for this type of thing. So maybe I can put together kind of a top five list after uh, I've done a little bit more research. And you know, let me say probably the best quality answer we're going to be able to provide on the pay-per-click management tools may come through our community. We have, as of today, over 34,000 members. And so I would encourage the person who asked that question to go to our website, uh, enter a, or start a discussion on our community and see what some of our other members are doing and what they're using for pay-per-click management. So that would probably be a great thing to include in one of our upcoming research studies as well, Jerry. So. So um, we appreciate uh, everyone's interest, attendance, and questions. You've been great with the questions. I'm sorry if we didn't get to yours, but I think it's time we need to say goodbye to everyone. So once again, thanks. We will send an email out in the next day or two with a link to the recording and where you can get the slides. And if there's anything we can do to help you, please don't hesitate to let us know. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye.